For the many decades that I've been involved in archaeological survey, it has always struck me how uneven survey results can be, with lots of sites of some periods and site types, but others, including Neolithic ones, rarely being discovered. In fact, of the many known Neolithic sites in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, it's noteworthy that hardly any of them were actually found by conventional foot surveys. Of some of the main Neolithic sites known in Jordan, for example, only three were found by foot survey and one by camel survey. In this graph, you see the distribution of discovery methods for Neolithic sites in the southern Levant where I was able to determine them from publications or my own research. A total of 16 sites in this sample were found either by normal field walking survey or by subsurface survey, the ones in blue being those found by my own Wadi Zaklab project. Meanwhile, some 24 sites were discovered as the result of some kind of construction activity. Typically, when bulldozers or other heavy equipment cut through sites during terracing for agricultural development, digging fish ponds or sewer lines, or for house construction, but especially for road construction, as here at Ein Gazal, one of the best known pre pottery Neolithic sites in the region. Neolithic sites, especially if they have substantial architecture or plaster floors, are highly visible in bulldozer cuts. Yet, in the Mediterranean zone of the southern Levant, these sites are virtually invisible to surveyors otherwise, as there may be virtually no artifacts on the modern surface. Of those that do surface, highly distinctive lithics, such as the products of pre pottery Neolithic B, so called Naviform technology, may help us identify the site easily. But we're not always that lucky. Some lithic scatters that may well be of late Neolithic age, meanwhile, only exhibit unretouched expedient flakes, not diagnostic enough for us to date the scatter specifically to the Neolithic. Low-fired Neolithic pottery does not tend to preserve well on the modern surface either, so it almost never occurs in these scatters. Occasionally, though, we're lucky enough to find one or two distinctive sickle elements that allow us to date the scatter more precisely. Traditional archaeological surveys, meanwhile, can exhibit various kinds of bias. My original 1981 survey in Wadi Zaklab in northern Jordan, using conventional sampling methods, did not discover any sites that I could confidently assign to the Neolithic. Instead, it found large numbers of sites belonging to the Early Bronze and Iron Ages, and especially to the Roman and Byzantine periods. Those are sites that have high visibility and tend to occupy the tops of hills where they're subject to erosion, rather than the lower slopes or terraces of valleys where Neolithic sites tend to occur. The survey did find some nondescript lithic scatters that could have been Neolithic, but those included no diagnostic Neolithic artifacts. In the hope of changing our luck, subsequent field research in Wadi Zaklab turned to more intrusive ways of finding elusive and potentially buried sites. We started by sampling stream terraces along the main canyon of Wadi Zaklab and parts of two of its tributaries with test pitting from 1987 to 92. Surveying this way addressed the problem of the Neolithic's low visibility in this region, given Neolithic sites' tendency to occupy the lower slopes or low terraces of valleys, where they're susceptible to being buried by colluvium eroded from the slopes above them. The survey by test pits involved excavating one or two one meter by two meter pits into each of the stream terraces, shown here as small gray polygons. We excluded terraces wherever geoarchaeological examination showed that the terrace had to be too recent to have existed during the Neolithic. This kind of survey led to several discoveries of Neolithic sites, most notably Tabakan Buma, WZ310 or Al Aqaba, Tel Rakan, Al Basatin, as well as localities where we found Neolithic sites that were not necessarily in primary context or were not necessarily at sites. The first site we found with the test pit survey was at Tabakan Buma, where we dug two test pits on a low terrace next to the stream channel of the Wadi in 1987. Our very first test pit uncovered big stone slabs that turned out to be covering a large cis grave that contained whole and restorable Yarmoukian pottery, that is, pottery of the early pottery Neolithic, as well as a stone bowl, a stone pallet, and fragmentary remains of two human skeletons. We expanded into bigger excavations in 1990 and 92. These show that the level with the large Yarmoukian cist graves were later covered by a farmstead or small hamlet of what archaeologists call the Wadi Raba period at the transition from the late Neolithic to Chalcolithic. 
It showed well-built stone walls of several houses with storage features and a stone platform. There were at least four stratigraphic phases of these houses, each with distinctive Wadi Raba tools and pottery. There was also an Epipaleolithic occupation at the site, dating to about 20,000 years ago, at much greater depth. We found child burials in small cysts in the Wadi Raba levels, but we also found a second large Yarmoukian cyst grave underneath one of the Wadi Raba buildings. Once we removed the cover slabs, we found that this cyst contained the skeleton of a young woman and a small child wearing a dentelium shell necklace. Carbon dates, although with large errors, confirm that this grave also belongs to the Yarmoukian or early pottery Neolithic phase at the site. In subsequent years, we found several more sites with Neolithic occupation, some by test pit survey and some by examining road cuts and stream banks. With the exception of Wadi Taiba, this table only shows sites where we conducted excavations. The surveys recovered Neolithic artifacts from at least six other localities in either test pits or surface survey. One of these site discoveries was Tel Rakan. It's a small tell on the edge of Wadi Zaklab's main canyon with a long stratigraphic sequence from PPNB through Wadi Raba, the period that marks that transition from the Neolithic to the Chalcolithic, and there's also remains there of the Chalcolithic, Early Bronze Age, and Classical periods. It's noteworthy that this site was within one of the sample quadrats of the 1981 survey, but wasn't discovered then. It only became visible after bulldozing to create fish ponds cut into the site about 1985. Otherwise, it just blended into the hilly landscape here. And the way the site was discovered is that one of our team members, Ian Kite, was excavating a couple of one by one meter test pits on the northeastern edge of the site when he happened to notice the bulldozed section with the remains of Neolithic buildings. We discovered Albacetin about a kilometer west of Tel Rakan through test pitting. Later, we expanded excavation and found portions of stone walls and stone paved floors and platforms, all dating to the Wadi Raba period, with an early Bronze I phase above it. It's again noteworthy that this site also was inside one of my 1981 survey quadrats, but again, we didn't discover it then, even though we even parked our car right in the middle of the site one day. Its low visibility results from the fact that early bronze deposits are almost half a meter down, and the Neolithic ones are more than a meter below the modern surface. The pottery from Albacetine shows many of the same forms as those found at Tabagat al Buma, but had the additional feature of vessels with intentionally roughened surface treatment and greater use of pebble and press bases. We conducted chemical residue analysis on 10 sherds from this site, and eight of them showed evidence for fatty acids consistent with degraded adipose fats of goats or wild boar from the region. Most likely, these came from vessels used either to cook meat or to extract bone marrow. None showed any evidence for dairy fats. In the early 2000s, we did geoarchaeological survey in the lower valley of Wadi Zaklab, but also in the western half of Wadi Taiba, just to its north. Wadi Taiba is a narrower wadi with steeper sides than Wadi Zaklab, and has fewer terraces than with any potential for late prehistoric occupation. We did some test pitting in some of these terraces, leading to several discoveries of Epipaleolithic sites, but also a site about four kilometers east of the Jordan Valley, which we call WT4 or Ain al Musmar. This is a deltaic terrace where a steep tributary gully flowing from a spring enters Wadi Taiba and it shows artifacts of a wide range of periods up to the Byzantine period. Here, along the toe of the slope, where you see the wiggly red line, we found epipaleolithic blades, bladelets, and single platform pyramidal cores for making them. Late Neolithic and later artifacts, including informal or amorphous cores for napping flakes, sickle elements, and basalt grinding stones, were mostly noticeable where a farmer had used a bulldozer to level a field, approximately where you see these other red squiggly lines. Interestingly, the farmer's field wall, just a short distance upstream of WT4, appears to have been built partly of ground stone artifacts that he probably found while bulldozing the site. After some years of excavation at al Basitin, we moved on to survey in Wadi Kaseba to the north of Wadi Taiba. As in nearby Wadi Zaklab, we designed our 2012 to 2013 survey there to target late prehistoric and especially Neolithic sites. 
But we now use predictive modeling and Bayesian methods to help us focus survey where Neolithic sites were most likely to be found. This is particularly important when survey resources, such as the number of people on the crew and the number of days available for survey, are scarce. One look at Google Earth, or one short walk around northern Jordan, should convince you that the modern landscape is not at all like the Neolithic one. At the edge of the Jordan Rift Valley, both tectonic events and downcutting of streams have sharply dissected ancient surfaces. Subsequent erosion and deposition have further destroyed or deeply buried other surfaces. Modern land use has also had an impact. Consequently, only small fragments of the Neolithic landscape survive, and those were our focus. In a GIS, we define landscape elements, or polygons, that are likely remnants of Neolithic surfaces that are not too deeply buried by colluvium for us to find artifacts in them. We allocated prior probabilities that each polygon contains Neolithic remains using expert opinion and criteria like distance to springs and stream confluences, using past experience in Wadi Zaklab as a guide. As in search and rescue, we used Bayesian methods to allocate our daily survey effort. First, for a set of polygons that are fairly close together, for practical reasons, we input their current probabilities. An algorithm evaluated these probabilities, adjusted into densities by dividing by polygon area, and allocated the total length of survey transect that we should walk in each polygon that day. Some polygons got no allocation at all because they failed to meet a threshold. Once the survey team had its allocations, we spread out and began walking the required transects for the distances set by the algorithm, looking for artifacts on the surface and in gullies and other exposures. Each day's work contributed to an updated version of the model and our next iteration of allocation. We didn't automatically assume that our failure to find Neolithic materials in a polygon on our first attempt meant that none are there. Instead, that polygon's probability went down by an amount related to its survey coverage. Often, the algorithm directed us to conduct further survey in that same polygon at some future date as long as its probability density was still high enough. Doing this in an iterative fashion has real effects. Take polygon 335, for example. It has many of the characteristics that would give it a high probability. Yet several iterations of survey on this polygon nonetheless found nothing. Although its probability went down each time we surveyed it without finding anything, it was still high enough to receive further allocations of survey. Finally, on the fourth set of survey transects across this terrace, we found a handful of crude sherds and a couple of lithics and groundstone fragments that were likely to be Neolithic. And we followed this up with some test pitting. The test pitting led to discovery of several late Neolithic stone paved surfaces, pits, and poorly preserved architecture, and we expanded some of these test pits to expose more of these. We named the site Jawafat Shaban after the guava orchard there. The excavations also yielded a lot of Wadi Rava pottery, lithics, and groundstone artifacts, including an almost complete basalt mortar. Our iterative surveys also led to the discovery of small numbers of late Neolithic artifacts on two other polygons close to Jawafat Shaban. It's not clear whether these are separate sites or just peripheral activity areas associated with the site at Jawafat Shaban. It didn't always require multiple surveys before we found things, however. We discovered another site on the very first round of allocated survey in the lower canyon of Wadi Kuseva. We followed this up with small test excavations to confirm that it was a Yarmoukian site and more extensive ones in subsequent years. The lowest level at this site, which we call Tapakata Rotuba, has many pits dug into the underlying marl. The pits contained ashy sediment that included Yarmoukian sherds, unretouched flakes, pieces of mud brick, and fragments of crab carapace and crab claws. One of them also contained a broken stone figurine. Apart from poorly preserved traces of some early Bronze Age occupation close to the modern surface, the entire stratigraphic sequence at this site yielded abundant Yarmoukian pottery, lithics, and groundstone over some one and a half meters of deposit. Excavations upslope from the earlier pits exposed extensive stone architecture that accompanied this Yarmoukian pottery. The uppermost architecture in this part of the site included a stone-founded oval building, but during the 2018 excavation, we were just starting to see the corner of a mud brick building that underlay it. In 2022, we exposed most of this mud brick building, 
here shown in views captured with LiDAR. It had one large room built directly on bedrock with an adjacent storage room with two phases. On either side of these rooms were outdoor courtyards with pits and a fire hearth. The stone walls in the image are remnants of the later oval-shaped stone building which we had not removed. Aside from pottery, the finds from this site included a broken stone figurine already mentioned, fragments of several broken clay figurines, many incised stones, including this one with what appears to be an incised and painted scene, spindle whorls, and this nice bifacial knife. When we look at the distribution of site discoveries in Wadi Zaklab, Wadi Taiba, and Wadi Kaseba, there are some interesting and perhaps unexpected patterns. Normally, we might expect Wadi Raba sites to be relatively rare, yet here we found somewhat more of them than Yarmoukian sites, and many more than PBNB ones, even if we include the localities, noted here with a question mark, where we just found naviform cores or bidirectional blades that we couldn't assign to any particular phase of PPNB or that might not belong to a site. If this pattern is real, it belies the common assumption that there was a decline in population or activity in the late Neolithic, although, of course, site size is also a factor. Speaking of size, I should also note that most of these sites are quite small, usually well under one and a half hectares, only Tel Rakan being somewhat larger. The general Neolithic category on the graph includes scatters that have reasonably large numbers of expedient flakes and some amorphous cores, likely to be Neolithic, but not of any particular phase, and potentially even Calcolithic in date. What is not included here are isolated finds of clearly Neolithic artifacts, such as sickle elements found without any other potentially Neolithic artifacts in their vicinity. It's also notable that we didn't find any Natufian or PPNA sites, despite years of trying. I suspect that's because they would likely have been somewhere near where Wadi Zaklava enters the Jordan Valley. That area was extensively bulldozed in the early 1960s when they built the Zaklava Dam, and those activities could easily have destroyed any site that might have been there. I should mention that we did find a single Alkion point, one of the so-called type fossils of the PPNA, at Tabagat al -Buma but it was in a Wadi Raba context. There's no way to tell how it got there, whether there's a PPNA site nearby that we simply haven't found, or some Wadi Raba resident found it in the landscape and brought it home as a keepsake, or perhaps it was from an arrow someone lost while hunting and it became redeposited at Tabagat al Buma from someplace upslope. To conclude, finding Neolithic sites in the Mediterranean zone can take perseverance and a variety of methods that go well beyond the conventional single-pass field walking survey. Yet this effort is worthwhile and demonstrates that the density of Neolithic sites in the Mediterranean zone of the Levant is probably much higher than previous research has suggested. The pathways we follow in our Neolithic research have a substantial impact on how many Neolithic sites we find, what kind of sites those are, and where they occur. Fuller understanding of how early farming societies in this region developed and thrived depends on more complete knowledge of these site distributions, and we will only attain that level of knowledge with more targeted archaeological surveys.